are there any chemicals or toxins of any type in my drinking water? And do I need to be concerned about this? So it's interesting, you know, I've been doing this now almost nine or 10 years. And, and really, I started off, you know, eating cheese Whiz and Oreos. And, you know, I really was not in a place where chemicals was even on my radar. The only reason I got into this, and some people may know this story from the book that I just published, it's all in the introduction um, of my journey, is that my dog got ill. And when my dog got really sick and developed autoimmune hepatitis, which is actually interesting because I'm an autoimmune disease specialist for humans, um, unfortunately, it's, you know, it's so rare in dogs and particularly golden retrievers that I was just so dumbfounded. I started researching what made him, made him sick, whether it was his drinking water contaminated. We live in New Jersey, um, you know, with lots of pesticides, you were the garden state, right? Um, and I looked at his food quality and I looked at, you know, anything, his flea and tick collar, his plastic toy in his mouth. And, you know, this journey has been a long one, but it has been based on evidence that I have gathered and it's built a, a repertoire of what's truth. And one of the things that has stood out beyond any other topic, at least in terms of kind of shouting on mountaintops is drinking water. And I think people don't realize how dirty American drinking water is. Um, and this is actually the number one talk I give nationally to programs, because when you get to the down and dirty, the one law safe drinking water act of 1974, requires only 91 chemicals to be studied, monitored, and, and remediated at the over 160,000 water treatment plants in the US. That one law still holds in 2021. It is the 1974 Safe Drinking Water Act. I suggest people look it up because this is the, one of those things that really blew my mind. And those 160,000 water treatment plants are, are city water, serves about 75 to 80% of the US population. The other 20% really um, comes from wells and wells don't require any testing at any time unless you have to sell the property. So people sit on wells and never get it tested and yet soil and chemicals for manufacturing and runoff and sewage and coal ash and fracking will make their way through soil into the areas where wells serving homes, serving schools, um, rural populations really are, are the main source of their drinking water. So the number one thing I always talk about and what I, what I shout on mountaintops is please try to filter your drinking water. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Don't bother testing it if you don't want to spend the money on that. Spend the money on a $300 um, reverse osmosis water filter that's well vetted and certified that has a carbon component. Um, these are not expensive anymore and anyone really can afford them. So that's what I say, you know, it could be carbon filter, which is a pitcher, a faucet, it could be your refrigerator door. It can be always uh, all the way up to an extreme, you know, aggressive um, form of cleaning water, which I agree with is reverse osmosis, but any type of filtration to me is, is a good effort. And uh, it's especially important in young people who have a smaller body mass index so their volume of water, even compared to an adult, is much higher than us. Are there any diseases that have gone up in the last 50 years that you believe correlate with environmental toxins and chemicals? Absolutely. And this has been well studied from the epidemiology um, literature, but I'm a rheumatologist. I will tell you clinically, I would say this, even without looking at the actual research numbers, um, that we are seeing not only more autoimmune disease, we are seeing it in younger people, we are seeing not only more cancers, uh, we are seeing it in younger people, especially thyroid cancer, which is highly associated with environmental chemicals. I'm seeing patients on uh, thyroid medication, even if it's not cancers, um, they are on young people on thyroid medication, which normally was, you would think, reserved for postmenopausal women with some thyroid um, abnormalities occasionally. But what, you know, it's it, now 10% of the US population has auto, some type of autoimmune disease, which is not because we're getting better at diagnosing it, it's because it's just more common. And we're talking MS, all the rheumatology issues like you know, rheumatoid, lupus, polymyalgia, um, rheumatica, um, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, some of the GI autoimmune diseases. Um, and so we really are at a point where I got so frustrated in my own career of handing out medications only. And there, I'm not against meds, but only as my only tool that I actually trained with Dr. Andrew Weil and his um, integrative medicine program that's run with wonderful MD, PhDs, evidence-based program, two years board certified, like the real deal. 
um, because I was just so frustrated with the tools that I had. And now I have more tools. Um, I have better ways of evaluating environmental health conditions. I ask people in environmental health history. Um, and so all of these really do play out into human health and what we can prevent and what we can treat. And when you have all of these tools, medicines plus an integrative approach, you can really, you know, help people, I think the most. And that's what I've seen with my, my practice. And, um, you know, as I go through with my journey in difficult patients. How did the industrial machine of companies like Monsanto evolve from the war effort to production of commercial goods? Well, very interesting. You know, in the 1950s, you know, and even the graduate, the movie, right? Going into plastics, that was where to go. And in fact, that was true. I mean, that was an exploding industry. We had Naugahyde and Rayon and, um, you know, from Mica and Plexiglass and, um, you know, food storage changed dramatically, which was a good thing, right? Instead of using um, natural resources like wood and, um, I'm trying to think of other forms that they used to use, but essentially, um, you know, you could have an aluminum can that was lined with bisphenol A plastic and you could store food in a can and send it overseas in World War II uh, to soldiers and you'd be able to keep that food safe. Um, and so there was good intention, I believe. Back in the 1950s, it was very exciting to have um, all different types of plastics, um, but that was also the time that they were also coming up with pesticides and insecticides and ways to protect troops overseas as well from malaria um, and, and a lot of infectious issues. What happened though, is that floodgate opened and you know, plastics started to be used for everything. Um, you know, dishes and packaging. And, um, and then we start, you know, because basically what happened was this, this even BPA is one of the first ones where they actually are basically epoxy resins or, or these, these compounds that are kind of connected and interlocked. And you can have clear plastic that was from there uh, back many years ago. That's how they started having clear plastics. The problem is, is now we know that they aren't solid materials. And those, those monomers, those epoxy resin compounds actually leach, you know, break apart. And that's how we're getting it into our food containers and from food containers into our food. That's how we're getting BPA getting into our food as well. So all canned foods get exposure, you know, people get exposure to BPA. Um, and so again, a great idea, perhaps, um, very marketable, exciting um, for usable materials, right? But we didn't think about also the downstream uh, waste issues and how we break these components down. So there was no full picture of how these are created and then how they are broken down safely and not affecting um, our environment, which gets into our water and gets into our food. So it's one big cycle that wasn't truly thought out. Um, so I'm hoping that now we have green chemistry, we have people that are working on wonderful solutions um, for food packaging composition, um, for food storage, for cosmetic chemicals. And so this is becoming a big area and I'm very hopeful about it. Mm -hmm.